Hey everybody, welcome to EduMatch. Thank you so much for joining us. So we are back after a hiatus and guess what? We're taking another one next week. So <laughs> this is an in between episode. So very excited to chat about sketch noting. So we have an awesome panel here. Uh, just wanted to, before we start, give a huge shout out to Teresa Gross. Um, you know, she she came up with the idea for this episode. So definitely uh, we hope to have her back as we bring this topic back. So we're just gonna start off with a couple of introductions from our wonderful panel. So let's start first with Raina. Hi, I'm Raina Friedman. I teach fifth grade in Mansfield, Massachusetts and I'm president elect of MassQ. And I just actually have been sketchnoting with kids for two years and this year we've gone full blown sketchnote in our classroom. Excited to be here. Hi, I'm Misty Klusner. I'm a digital innovation TOSA in Campbell, California, which is in the South Bay area. And I've been sketchnoting for probably about three to four years now and been sharing it with kids and love it. Sweet, thank you, Misty. And thank you also to Raina. All right, Martine, how about you? Um, I'm Martine Brown and I am the Ready One to One instructional coach in Garland ISD. Um, I got started with sketchnoting because I really love some work that one of my um, colleagues was doing. And I've been using scheduling to kind of help me process for professional development and training. Awesomeness, awesome. Great to have you here. And last and certainly not least, we have Manuel. Hey guys, uh, Manuel Herrera. Uh, I am an innovation coordinator uh, for, this, for St. Louis School District uh, Afton. It's kind of right outside of St. Louis. Um, I've kind of done this my entire life, um, finding somebody kind of put a label on it. <laughs> and so, which is kind of cool. Um, it's one of those things that I've done um, and always got in trouble for. So um, over the past, I don't know, I've done it for quite a while, but probably with kids, probably in the past four or five years, I've really started to like work with kids on it and work with teachers on it. So yeah, thanks for having me. Sweet, well, it's great to have you here, Manuel. So uh, great to hear from you and thank you everyone for your great introductions. So to kick things off with the very first question, then what exactly is sketchnoting and how did you get started with it? So we don't have any particular order, so just feel free to jump in with your response. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I think it was defined a bunch of different ways, but I think in short, um, it's it's using images and drawings um, and and text to kind of capture ideas um, that you've heard or that you, as you're consuming information, whether it's a video or a podcast or a, you know a Twitter chat or even a movie, television, radio, um, you're, you're taking all that and, and capturing it in a way where it, it becomes a visual. And I, I think where it kind of gets fuzzy is how you do it, you know, where, where, you know, there's some people do it with structure, some people don't do it with structure. Um, but yeah, usually it's kind of a, a, some type of doodle, some type of sketch of, of a word or an image um, in a combination with text. And one of the things I actually love about it, to piggyback off of what you said that my students really picked up on, is that the visual has to make sense to them as the learner. That they don't have to be perfect artists, that it can just be something, word, speech bubble, color, but it has to make sense to them and they can communicate about it. And I'm going to keep going off of that too. So I think the other thing working with kids is that um, a lot of times it's the perfectionist part comes into them. And so with sketch noting, it's really letting go of that perfectionist side. And again, right, with the visuals, like how can I get something that's in my brain onto paper really quick, but where it's something that you know, in two, three days or two, three months when I look at it, it still makes sense to me. So it's finding that balance as well. Um, and also thinking about how you can show really focusing on big ideas, right? Not trying to get all those little details down because um, it's just not possible when you're sketching and you try to get all the little details. So really thinking about that critical thinking piece and that critical listening. I think what I was most surprised by with the sketch note is exactly what Misty talked about, just how I shifted in the way I began to process information and collect that information and make meaning to it. I think that's what's most powerful for students. Um, I worked with a, a group of students who struggled with uh, behavior management and socializing, and we worked on sketch noting, and that was probably the most powerful piece once they realized that they could make decisions about how to make meaning of what they're learning and that it was it was foundationally in their hands um we had a out of the 10 to 12 kids we had like five who really ran with it for that reason and what you had said about making sense of your thinking there's a lot of that buzzword in education about making thinking visible mm -hmm. and this is a great way to accomplish that with yourself or with students 
Yeah, what, what I love and I think what makes it easier, it's kind of, it, it makes it difficult, but makes it easier is, um, you know, we all have these visuals in our head that are very different from the next person. And, and so when you do kind of let kids know that that's, it's for them or for you, or excuse me, you know, for them, um, you know, it's okay to like mess up. It's okay to use a different image. It's okay to make it quick, you know? And something I, I try to teach with kids when we first do that is, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, you know, with, with drawing, you can use simple shapes to represent anything. You know, we talked about a circle, how a circle can represent a person, a circle can represent um, an object, it can re represent anything. You can just, you know, underneath write text and start there. And then eventually you, you slowly start to build like that visual vocabulary. And I think we'll probably talk about that at some point. Um, but I love that. Like kids like own it. It's theirs. It's not anybody else's. And, and that kind of starts to let them, you know, bring some of those barriers down that prevent them from wanting to do it. Absolutely. So great answers for question one. So I wanted to say hello to everyone who is tweeting with us as well as everyone who is watching us on the YouTube live page. Lots of great people in the audience. So um, just a quick question that came from Lizette. So thank you, Lizette, for your question. Um, how can you use sketch noting with English language learners? Do any of you have a response to that one? I used it last year a lot in science, actually. It really helps students um, with the vocabulary piece to really understand like states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and the particles, and the way that the particles look in each of those states, that they could be able to draw that and then draw the phases just for a clear example, and then be able to talk about it. I mean, yeah, like just in general, it's just the fact that you're using visuals all the time because um, that's just so powerful when you're trying, because we can, we have a common visual library for many of us. So when you can put that visual and give them that tangible object, that really you know concrete thing to look at, it really does help until that language can come in and they can understand that and being able to provide that pairing. And it also helps with them communicating. They may not know the word, but they could at least draw a picture for you. Fantastic. I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Were you about no, to say something, Manuel? Yeah, it was like, that was a great point, Missy. Like, it's it's a great way to communicate something when you don't know it. I mean, you think about when we, you know, I don't know, like when I work with my kids, um, when my kids were little, like a lot of times we would draw things out just to communicate something because our vocabulary wasn't there. They couldn't have had a hard time explaining, but being able to see that at the same time, it, it, it's so powerful because that message is being communicated. Everybody knows, like, you know, I don't know like what a can looks like. So you can try to draw like a picture of a, I'm looking at a soda can here, but. Um, you can both look at that and everybody kind of has an idea of what that is and kind of can, can start to move forward with, with conversation or whatever it is. All right, great, great. So great responses. There was um, another question that came through YouTube Live about how to incorporate sketch noting into the early childhood classroom. So do any of you have tips on that? I'm actually about to go do a sketch noting lesson with some kinders and first graders this week. So I finally had to like figure out how to bring it down to their level because I've mostly only worked with um, upper elementary and middle. Um, and I think like what working with the teachers and talking, what we're really going to focus on is just talking about kind of actually how you would use it with your English language learners, how we have pictures in our head um, and how we want to be able to show that thinking and being able to communicate. Um, so we're actually going to um, just talk about how we can, you know, what could this symbolize, like holding up an apple, what are things apple could symbolize, what are things that a book could symbolize, and then we're going to be reading aloud a short nonfiction passage with them, and just pausing and having them draw what they're thinking, um, whatever that may be, but then also practice on then explaining that, then that picture, whatever it may be, because a lot of times we can't quite tell what our littles draw, right? They know what they mean, but we don't quite know what it is. So having them be able to explain that. So we have Seesaw, so they're gonna actually go into Seesaw and explain their sketch node of what they were doing um, and what they were thinking to us. Fantastic, all right. So we're getting some really, really great questions from our viewers. So Peggy, shout out to Peggy. She's saying that she struggles with uh, how to draw what she visualizes, and then she struggles with the drawing. When she struggles with the drawing, she misses out on the next point. So do y'all have any tips for Peggy? Um, yeah, I'll chime in on that. So one of the reasons why I really wanted to do sketch noting was because I'm not an artist. Like I don't have um, this fantastic like artistic skill. And initially when I first saw a couple of sketch notes, they were so well done that it was intimidating. And so I really had to work towards um, kind of removing that idea that what I see in my head 
it has to be that way. And instead I started building structures. So like there were certain times I would take certain notes a certain way or certain styles. So like if I'm doing some bullets, I mean, if I'm in one app, I may use perfect circles. And in another app, I might draw my own circles. Um, I also focused more on, um, cause for me, it was, it was important that I could do this digitally. Cause that was, I, I just felt like digitally it elevated the experience for me. And so for me, I worried less about finishing what was in my head and focused more on color coding. So those are some things that you can do in the eye when you're doing it, it's important. Well, with all things you have to practice. But you have to worry about processing. What's most important to me? What am I gravitated to when I listen to X? So like when I go to church, I sketch up the sermon because that gives me an opportunity to practice. Um, but I focus less on how well it matches with what's in my head and focus more on what colors am I using to really communicate that message again so that I can go back to it later. You know, I, I think... You know, it, when we talk, you talk about practice. It's definitely, you know, practice every while you learn. Like I'm sure, like you said, in church, there are probably certain images and certain things that are common that have kind of been said over time that you've eventually evolved those sketches. And that's what's great. So you, that's when you build that vocabulary in your head or this, this visual vocabulary in your head, you can, it's quick, it becomes quicker. So when you, the next time you write it, whatever you use to represent that, it, it, it comes, it comes quicker. I always like, also when I'm, when I'm listening, sometimes like, you're moved by what is being said or you're moved by what is being watched. And sometimes it's just the emotion, like that, that emotion that's transferring from your head to your hand, that also is, it becomes very metaphorical because that Im your image isn't necessarily a concrete image of what is being said, but more of just this uh, kind of this metaphorical drawing. And I think that is still sketching. That is still part of, um, you know, learning to process new information that's hard it's hard to process new information and, and and try to capture it all but you know i think that's a good that's a good place to start i know when they've gone over um and shown examples of different presidential doodles and and the kind of the situation that they were in and they kind of show what they drew which it was just a doodle it was more of like a, a listening exercise you can almost see kind of the emotions that came out or kind of the, the emotions they were feeling based on their drawing so it can even start with that um and so when they go back to reference that they're like, you know, oh, I noticed like that, you know, this was a very aggressive style doodling or this was a very whimsical type doodling that evoked like, oh, I remember now what they were talking about. So I mean, even if something as simple as that is a great place to start with kind of learning how to capture information that you're hearing or seeing. And one of the things we're working on is building an icon library. I would think that doing it digitally is probably a little bit easier because of the copy and paste and you can refine it, but my students are going to be doing it in paper. Um, and then another thing that I've done as well is that it's just even if you just take away the pictures, right? Because there are sketch notes that really, there are barely any images, right? They are, it's mostly the structure and the organization. But even just how you write your text, like if there's a key word or a key point that really pops out, like playing with the size, playing with the color, because that really shows like what stands out, what's important um, versus um, just having everything look the same. So even without pictures, you can still play around with your tools to make things show what's important and where your connections are. Yes, like the word melting, the letters melt down the page. So, something I do with, with our kids um, that is, I, I feel like it's, it's helped get into sketchnoting is kind of when I work with them, kind of their original ideas and original thought, maybe like they're doing some kind of activity where they're in groups or they're working together and they're problem solving or they're thinking or they're talking to each other. Um, I'll sit there and, and listen and I'll draw what they're saying or I'll have them like, okay, can you... Can you draw what you're saying? These are all original ideas. These are all their own thoughts. And so doing that, I think, helps them realize like drawings don't have to be so, so intricate and so complex to communicate. To communicate. And if they're starting with their original ideas, I feel like it's a little bit easier for them to, to draw something out rather than to listen, think about it, and then put it down. I, I feel like that's a good start sometimes. And we do a lot of it, um, like I said, mostly when they work in groups or when they work in partners because they – you know, we work with, you know, K-12. And so listening to elementary kids try to talk to each other, um, I have two elementary kids of my own and, and they, they have a very difficult time explaining themselves just because of how, you know, kids, they stutter or they repeat themselves or they loop or so we will draw it out and kind of help them tell a story. And so when they can go back and look at that, they've realized they've drawn this all out 
all for the purposes of communicating that to somebody else. It kind of goes back to that kind of the ELL piece. Um, and I, I think that's that helps too. Uh, I think that's a good entry point for people. So not necessarily or for kids or for adults. So not always listen to capture information, but also just write doodling your original thoughts or drawing your original thoughts. Um, that 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 helps too. Yeah, we actually use it a lot with design thinking um, with our kids because that's how they use it to show like their process and like their ideation and their plan because they were having a really hard time communicating like, you know, how do I get from point A to point B? So we found that sketch notes and just doodling really helped clear that communication piece up for them. All right, excellent, excellent. So I have to say, y'all are bringing the heat today. Everyone who is on the YouTube Live, they're bringing the heat. The chat is just on fire right now. So awesomeness, awesomeness. So we're gonna go to the second question. And a lot of people are asking to see sketch notes. So if you have some, please feel free to share, but um, just feel free to jump in. What is your sketch noting process? Like where and when you do it, I know some of you have already talked about that. Some materials you use, your quirks and some go-tos. Etc. So, uh, so what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll start. Uh, so, um, like I said before, I am not an artist, and I initially went into sketch noting thinking that I had to be one, and I was pleasantly surprised that that was not the case. So, for your, you know, students and and teachers too, um, who feel this need to be perfect, like my hand, my penmanship's not great. Like, part of my process was just letting all of those things go. Um, another thing that really helped me kind of uh, define kind of what I was doing is I worked on a sketch 50, which they usually do it in the spring. And I'll share with you my sketches so that you can see. The app um, that I used was called uh, Notability, but I pushed all of my final designs into a keynote. So I'll share my screen if I can. And um, we can take a look at to the entire screen. We can take a look at, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good, perfect. All right, so, um, so here are some sketches I did with Sketch 50, and the way Sketch 50 works is every day they give you a topic, and just Google Sketch 50 and it'll show up, um, and you use those prompts to help you draw, and this really gave me, like, there we go. Uh, resources and prompts. This gave me like a direction to go in. And so this was my day one. And I used the app that I used was Paper 53. And this just gave me my practice. And so as you as I move forward and learn more about the app, I also used an Apple Pencil. And I do think that's important to, to point out because I think it did impact the quality. Um, but I don't think you have to have an Apple Pencil to sketch note. It's just what I was doing, it, it, I will say it, it created a better result. Um, you know, I learned how to trace, so that also improved the quality. These are a pair of my mom's hands that I traced. And I did crawfish. I think, I'm pretty sure I traced that one. So this kind of helped me just build my skills, right? But then, and I'm also gonna show you, um, so these are some actual sketch notes, like I was either in training or professional development, so that you can kind of see a little bit of the systematic side of things. There we go. And I, I Notability is like my favorite app of all time when it comes to taking sketch notes. Oh, see if I can show you guys those. And so what I found, I tried to go back to some of my earlier ones so that you can get an idea of what, oh, that's a good one. So here's an early one I did when I really first started this process. And I, you know, I, I played with color, I worked with color, and then I kind of let it go, right? So that was kind of my beginning. And then as I moved along, I needed more structure. And our district at the time, um, we were focusing on using the Cornell note style. And I just thought from an instructional leadership standpoint, this would be a great way to combine the sketch noting and um, the Cornell note taking to show educators like 
you don't have to completely navigate away from traditional strategies, but you can also still include the sketch noting process. And so though it wasn't, you know, a hundred percent part of my notes, and that's this is generally probably a good example. Um, it definitely like is in there. Whereas before I would have just taken um plain notes. If y'all haven't heard of Steve Anderson, that's how I, I wrote his name. And he wears bow ties all the time. So it's just little things like that. And then I'll show you one more. Martine, while you're while you are switching to the new one, then Valerie was asking: Are Notability and Paper Fifty Three iOS uh, are they iOS apps? Uh, they are iOS and they are Android. I think. Here's another. Here's my last one, and then I'm gonna move on because I know we've got plenty of examples. And so this was a really. I remember this one because it was a, a lot of talking, like speeches, and so. This must have really stuck out to me. Teacher modeling is not teacher monologue. And then I did like teacher vomit because that's when they monologue because um, it's boring. So don't feel like, you know, it has to be this, you know, authentic learning. That must have been something important from that dialogue. Like, don't feel like you have to be just this great artist or that it has to have these perfect lines and bullets because it's just not true. So, all right, so I'm gonna pop off. I'm gonna pop, I'm gonna come off. Oh, I know resources. I started looking at Kathy Shock's guide to everything. She has a ton of resources for uh, sketch noting. Let's see if I can figure out how to stop. Okay, sorry. Very cool. Thank you so much, Martine. All right, great, great. Anybody else? Um, yeah, yeah I wanna, I'll show you kind of what I do. Um, as far as material goes and, and what I use, you know, I've definitely, I bought an iPad, I don't know, I guess six months ago and, and started using it to do, you know, some thinking and some drawing and, um, you know, I love it. It's, it's fantastic. It's, I'm, it's probably my, my go-to thing. But when I show kids and I show teachers, I try not to worry too much about the technology. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you guys and I have note cards. Like I use a lot of note cards and sticky notes. Um, to kind of, and, and when Misty said earlier, design thinking, like it is, they go hand in hand. Like the, when you get to a certain part, part of design thinking where you're ideating or brainstorming, you know, we don't teach kids how to brainstorm. We don't, we don't teach kids necessarily, I wouldn't say we don't, but we don't always do it. And, and I think we, that this is a perfect way to kind of lends itself to, to drawing, to show what you're thinking. Um, I get note cards and I get sticky notes and we do that. I'm going to show a quick, like two examples really quick. That's, but apparently I don't know how to work this. Um, to show my screen. How do I show my screen? There it is. This is my job. I should know how to do this, right? Um, let's see. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. So this is an example of two girls working on a video. Um, I'll just keep it like this. Um, there's two girls working on a video and part of the process was to like organize it all. And so they weren't necessarily taking notes, but they were more like showing what they were thinking in their heads. Because when we first started doing it, um, they had a hard time like, okay, well, I think we should put it here. I think we should do that. And, and usually when we work with kids or when kids work on projects that are, that are in the end going to be digital, that's the first thing they open. So say, for example, if we're doing a, a presentation, they're going to open Google Slides or they're going to open Keynote and they start adding and deleting and adju adjusting fonts and typefaces. Um, so I, I kind of have them step back and talk about what it is they're going to do. And I try to capture that as best I can. And then I have them do the same thing. And so when we have sticky notes, or index cards, we move it around. And, and in this example, they even threw in, you know, dry erase markers. Um, so I, I feel like that is, you know, that is awesome because you can do that in any class and that's like no budget. Like that's stuff that you already have in your classroom, even torn pieces of paper um, work for that. Um, here's another example. I love this example. Um, here's a, a great one as far as like not even using images, but just using words. Because we, you know, we were talking about, you know, kind of being reluctant to to draw things out. This girl was, um, the young lady was, again, creating another video. This is a different classroom, and you know, once we kind of got down to it, I said, well, why don't we, why don't we write out what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to, to research, and uh, you know, we showed her, okay, well, this is how you research, this is how you capture some of that information, this is how you can jot it down, you know, kind of quickly, and she started to do this with her group, and so now not only was she getting her ideas out, and they were they were visual, they were in front of her. Um, her her group could then see what they were doing. Her group knew where she was. Um, she was kind of the leader, you know, in high school. That you know, one person usually kind of does everything. Um, so 
this was great. And so now they can contribute to that conversation because everything that's in her head is now on a board. So everything is there. So now, again, she didn't use any images, but she used short phrases and words and kind of organized them in a mind map. I know we do this with, with kids and in, in, uh, in their pre-writing, uh, but this is, we, you know, this is a, for a video. And okay, I said, I said, this is my last one, I promise. Um, this is the same young lady in another class using sticky notes and she's showing her group how to do it with sticky notes. And it was awesome. Again, just use words, just use very little images. You can't really see them she did, because it was an engineering class, um, but she used the same idea. And I just thought, oh my God, that's, that's, that's awesome um, for her to then transfer those skills from one class in one setting to another and then, and then to teach someone else. So um, did I stop sharing now? Okay, cool. All right, sweet. And Lizette was asking um, if you would be able to like, um, I didn't want to interrupt you, but to put it on present while you were talking, but if you have like a link or something, I can just like copy and paste it over to the chat for her. Um, I know like for me, especially like when I go into classes, um, I try to go analog all the way. That's where I started. That's where I love. I got an iPad Pro a year ago for my new position and I love it and it's amazing. Um, and so on iPad Pro, I use um, Adobe Sketch and Procreate are the two apps that I use on there, um, just because I like the layering feature. Um, but uh, And Adobe Sketch is free, so if you want to play with apps, it's a fun free one to play with. But with kids, right, they don't always have that technology. Um, so we try to always go analog. We do is a lot of um, index cards, sticky notes, back of, you know, scratch paper. Um, and so with them, and like even with me, a lot of times I find um, when I'm sketch noting. I actually will start in pencil. I break the rule a little bit. I don't let the kids do this, but I'll start in pencil just until I start to kind of get the idea of where the presenter is going, um, especially with live sketch noting. So I can kind of plan it out and then probably about like 15 minutes in, then I'll start to go into pen because that way I have the ability to move stuff around. Um, and the other thing that I found really helps is I'll keep like a pad of sticky notes or just an extra piece of paper on the side. So that if I hear something, but I know I'm not ready to quite put it on the sketch note yet, I'll take a note of it. Because what happens, right, is then they move on, you forget, and they're like, oh, what was that one thing? So I'll have just um, something on the side so I can just kind of keep notes um, on it. And then you guys asked like, for people to show. So I don't have a like, screen share because it's analog style. But um, so I have like, you can see like on some of mine, way on there, yay. Okay. So like a lot of times, like this is from a podcast. That's one of the ways I love practicing. John Spencer's podcasts are great because they have numbers. So you know how many things you're going to put on your page. That's a really way, great way to practice organization. Um, and with kids, what I love with podcasts is you can tell them you can put pause. You can go back, right? So it's a great way to kind of warm up. Um, I also, when I'm reading and I'm doing like book studies, I like to sketch note at the end of chapters because that way, if I'm trying to come back to something. So we did an innovators mindset book study in my district. So that was kind of what I did. Um, and I was really on this one, like every time I sketch note, I try to come up with like a goal. So on this one, I was trying to do like color minimizing color so it didn't look like a rainbow vomited on my page, um, which is something I try to teach kids as well. Um, and then also the other thing I love sketchnoting are keynotes. And I think it's because that ties into um, what Manuel's talking about, right? that emotional thing, because keynotes always get you. There's always an emotional something that gets you and it makes it so easy to sketchnote them. I love them. And you're not really necessarily trying to record, I guess, like, you know, like how to do, do something, right? You're just really capturing like the big message. So last year, um, or two years, was it last year, I think? Yeah, Brad Monty was the, the keynote at FallQ. Um, and uh, so, you know, like playing around, and he's great because he gives you a lot of visuals when he's talking. But you can see like my, my style goes all over the place. Sometimes I work in a circular pattern, sometimes they work down. Um, and so it's also really thinking about like what works best for you. I actually find I'm less of a perfectionist analog than I am digitally. And I think it's because with digitally, you can have the grids and you can arrange it more. And so I actually get stuck in that more. So I actually, revert more to um, analog style. But, um, and then what I will share with you, Sarah, too, is I have a link to like our presentation we do on sketch noting and sketch 50. So it has like a bunch of resources, all the apps, how, things we use digitally, things we use analog that you can do with your kids, so. And she may not shout herself out, but you ha if you're not following Misty on Instagram, you have to go and look at her sketches. They're, they're awesome. She posts all of her stuff up there, so you definitely have to go see it. Likewise, I'm like Manuel, too. <laughs> which, is how I, which is how I found you was through sketch noting and then yes. we and met in Austin. So anyways, okay, side note. But yes, follow Misty. She's got great stuff on there. Oh, let's get those handles then. What what are your Instagram handles? I'm easy, Misty Klusner. <laughs> and I'm I'm Manuel Herrera33. Sorry, there's a lot, that's a lot, that's long. <laughs> 
Cool, cool. Well, there's there's lots of great conversations still going on in the chat. Um, the next question, I believe that we've already kind of touched on this, but I just wanted to circle back to see if there was anything else that y'all wanted to add about how educators could use this strategy with their students to enhance learning. So if anyone has anything else on that question, please feel free to, to drop those gems. So our students do, I guess what you would equate to almost like a genius hour type of project. Once a month, they go on a discovery quest where they have a big question that they have to answer and teach the class. I have never had a way to see what my other 20 plus kids are getting from their classmate. So now when students are presenting, the other students in the class are actually sketchnoting all of the kids' different research. So there'll be five um, different kinds of sketch notes on one piece of paper. So I can see what the students are learning. We started um, doing a lot of storyboarding with things, with kids. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the tools that we use a lot in our schools and our elementary is Bloxels. It's a video game um, design tool. But what I was finding was that um, kids were creating and they were creating some awesome, awesome projects, but um, their stories were were not probably where they needed to be or they, they could use some help. And so we started storyboarding a lot with kids. Again, paper, pencil, very analog. I mean, just like Misty, it's, um, you know, index cards, those kind of things, so that they can put together a story about what their video game is, especially when they came into content, uh, when you got dealt with history, most likely, most more so, and, so, and uh, social studies and ELA. Um, those are very, those are very story, story driven. And so we started doing that with kids. Um, these are practices we've always done with students, but when we get to the digital tools, we kind of forget to go back and use those old strategies that really work well. Um, so um, I, I definitely look into you know some of those graphic organizers like like that um, and find those really helpful. There was one question I forgot to ask from Katie McNamara in the chat. She was asking about uh, when we we're talking about the different apps for sketch noting. Are there any for Chromebooks that you all could recommend? Google um, Draw. We there's Google one Draw. that's called Sketch. Oh, I gotta look it up. Um, there is one. It's called Sketch. I O. Let me just look it up. Um, yes. Yeah, there is one. They can use their mouse. Um, let me go back. Um, that they can, if they have, because I know depending on what brand they have, if you have the ones that you can write on the Chromebook with a pencil, you can flip it over into tablet mode and then write on it with pencil. Um, so that is one that, that I know of that I just shared with some teachers that could work. And we use Google Draw and one of the most underrated Google tools ever in my mind is Google Keep because it also allows you like an online sticky note, but it also allows you to pull from a draw feature so they could do both. And I like how Misty had said, I think it was Misty that had the sticky note right on the side of the computer in case you forget the word. You can do the same thing in Google Keep. Yeah, I love Google Keep because it has that draw feature. If they have Seesaw, that's another thing if their district uses Seesaw. The other thing that's actually great is Google Auto Draw. So um, I don't know if you guys have ever done the a fun drawing activity with your kids is Google Quick Draw. It's, um, it was one of their experiment, like passion project AI apps that they did. And so if you go to Google Quick Draw, it's this program. It's actually really fun to do if you don't have a touch screen Chromebook where you have to use a, the trackpad because we all suck at drawing with a trackpad. Um, and so it'll yell things out at you and you have like you have to try to draw it within a certain amount of seconds and it'll start questioning what you're drawing and you realize how bad you are. Um, but what it's actually doing is it's gathering all this data. And so then they launched auto draw. And so when you try to draw something with your trackpad, um, it actually now recognizes what you might be trying to draw based on the data collected from the other program. And it'll give you a bunch of icons at the top of your screen. Um, and so then you can actually pull that icon into your drawing and it lets you do also just free draw and it lets you type in text as well. So it's a really great way, um, especially if you do have people that are resistant to drawing or if they don't have a touch screen, it, it can be really hard to draw with a trackpad that kind of opens that field up a little bit, which is cool. Fantastic. All right, wonderful. We have another question coming from Michael Sinclair. He says, how do you encourage the kids who may have been told by teachers, parents, siblings, or peers that they can't draw to take sketches for their notes. So the so the people, the kids who might have like that low self-esteem about the drawing, um, then how, how can you encourage them? I would say um, that's why I'm big about showing because I mine design, like they're not beautiful. Again, my pen chip's not beautiful. 
And I like that question, but you, from an instructional coaching position, you also have to give encourage teachers to take this on um, because of, you know, I'm high school, so usually the big joke among high school teachers is we don't, you know, we don't have great penmanship, or we don't draw, or we don't write as neatly as elementary school. Um, and so the the big thing is model, 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 and talking about your mistakes and talking about the things that went well with the specific sketch note and things that didn't go well, and you know, giving them the freedom to do it and not worrying about the end product and really celebrating the end product. I think those are the things that are most important. Um, but I know for campuses, the, the first step from, from my perception is just getting the teachers on board with trying it because there has been for so long this idea that it has to be neat and straight lines and, and perfect. I, I agree. I think, um, is it on? Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, you have to get the teachers, no, have to get, but you want the teachers to do it as well. You want them to model it. Um, I've got an elementary teacher that I just worked with in second grade and we were reading Frog and Toad, which is great because I'm learning all these books that clearly I didn't read to my kids. Um, but we were, we were learning to, to um, take notes or go back and reflect on the story. And we were using kind of emojis as um, emotions, just for emotions between the two characters and, and comparing them. You know, saying like, if you still use the same graphic organizers, but now use you know some drawings in them, and it was great. And um, you know, I asked her. I said, okay, so you have to do this too. And she's like, oh, well, well, what I can, but I can't draw. And I said, well, it's not about drawing. Remember, we're just it's emoji, like it's a smiley face, and you know. And so I, I think that's huge. And also, I, I really, in a, and the more I'm looking into this, the more I'm talking to teachers, the more I'm asking about um, how to introduce this. I almost sometimes I'm almost leaning towards like not saying that it is we are we are all going to sketch note um because it becomes as a big event which which is good and bad i mean I, you know i think there is maybe some benefit to exciting the kids about drawing but i'm wondering if we just do it as the way we think and just show them by modeling it that they they would just think okay that's that's just how it's done um i don't know i'm, I'm I, it's just something that i'm thinking about the past i guess two weeks actually I, and kind of looking into research is do we have to make it an event? Do we have to make it a, it's kind of like the hour of code. We all, we're all gonna code for, you know, for that hour or for that week during computer science week. And it's this event. Well, if we were just coding or we were just, you know, writing programs, that is just what we do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what the difference would, would be in that. Um, I don't know, I mean, maybe it's, it's just, it's just again, just something I'm thinking, something I wonder. Um, and that goes back to like, you just, the teacher has to be kind of comfortable doing it. Um, and even if it is like, as you're talking, I have a social studies teacher that at the high school, I'm trying to get her to do it. Just as you're talking about things to just, just draw, like dude, just doodle it. Like even if it's a line or even if it's a, a graphic organizer and even say, you know, just don't even draw attention to it. Just kind of do it and see how kids respond. See if kids grab onto that and maybe start doing it themselves. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. That's, that's just more of a, my thinking right now. I don't, really know if that was an answer. So I took a risk and I dropped my regular writing lessons the last, this week and, and last week because it's a form of communication, right? It is writing. It's not, it doesn't have to be the five paragraph essay because in reality, who writes a five paragraph essay anymore? But one of the things that I did was I um, weaved it into our social emotional lessons. We started having this um, CARES, it's an acronym, but the first letter is cooperation. So I actually modeled, we're not one to one, so the kids had paper, but on my, we have a smart board and I did um, cooperation on the smart board. And I show them how you could even take a word or a concept or a feeling and sketch note it, which really seemed to help them. I saw a lot of eyes opening. We also looked at some of Sylvia Duckworth's work. And then there was a teacher who had shared some of her students' work from littles all the way up to seventh, eighth grade. So even seeing other kids' examples and saying, hey, these are being done all over the world. Like, let's try it and see what happens was a real motivator for kids and for myself, because I honestly had no idea what I was doing. So um, kind of piggybacking off on that. Um, so when we launched Sketch 50 my first year, two years ago, I actually did it with my class. So it was with sixth through eighth grade kids. And when they'd come in, they'd get an index card and they just have the word on the board. And they they just had to doodle whatever that word inspired in the brain. Like how could, and it was easy for like fire and, and school. You know, like some of them are really tangible, but then we got into words like empathy um, and um, these like more abstract concepts. So it was really fun to kind of see where where they went with that. And they struggled a little bit, but at the same time, it was nice because 
they they got to see just how different people interpret different things because then I th we would share it all in Google Classroom. They got to see, and it was nice because everyone just suspended judgment. We talked about how stick figures are totally, you know, the one things I always do when we do um, sketch notes, we talk about stick figures are highly encouraged because the idea is you want to get it from your head to the paper as quickly as possible, right? It's not about being beautiful. Um, and then also when I go into classrooms to teach sketchnoting, because kind of on your idea, I'm being worried about not being a big event, is we talk about how this is just a tool for your toolbox. Um, and some people, when they sketchnote, they use a lot of words and not a lot of pictures. Some people use mostly pictures, no words. So it's really finding what works best for you. I find a lot of kids start with words and they are, especially the older they get, right? They don't want to draw. They've given themselves that label. I'm not an artist. I can't draw. And um, so what they do is they'll just do a lot of words, but then they start to like, after like two or three lessons, they'll look around and they see the kids that are drawing and are having fun and they kind of want to draw too. And you'll see them start to just gradually bring it in on their own. But I never try to force it because um, you don't want them, you know, you don't want them to feel unsuccessful at something. I just, again, remind them it's a tool for your toolbox. And I do make teachers sit down and do the sketchnoting lesson with their kids. So they do have to draw with us for that first hour. So that way the teacher's modeling that they're learning as well. All right, fantastic. So, so for our next question, um, which is our pen ultimate question, then we've already covered some of this ground, but uh, just wanted to put this back out there. Do you have any tips or resources that you could share with others who want to get started with sketch noting? And um, also for anyone who's watching or listening, if you check the Edumatch hashtag, then they've been, you know, we've been tweeting them out as they've been coming through. Um, but any other ones, uh, tips or resources where people can go to start uh, with on their sketch noting journey? I created a slideshow that I actually tweeted out already with the EduMatch hashtag. So if anyone wants to see what I used, and huge thank you to some of the other educators that put their stuff out there because I was able to link it out because modeling is clutch for anybody, even myself. Um, I'm, I'm trying to put together some something for teachers, I'm kind of, uh, it's kind of a project. Um, so I don't have a resource, but I have possibly like, if somebody, if anybody wants to be a part of this, I'm trying to create some protocols for kids to use when kind of thinking, and it incorporates some drawing and some sketching. Um, so if anybody's interested in doing that, uh, that'd be great, because then by doing that, I'll give you what I'm trying to create, what I'm trying to research. Um, because now like this is, it's always been something I've done, and I've always say these things, and and I hope that people like them. But now I feel like I really need to have something behind that, and I need to have like some organization in it. And so this is just part of me doing it for my teachers. Um, but I need some like I hate to say guinea pigs, but <laughs> I need some people to like try this out and see what they think and give me feedback on it. Um, so there's that. Um, and, and then if you're looking for a book, um, somebody I recently started to look at was um, Dave Gray. Uh, it's just D A V E G R A Y. Um, he is one of, uh, it's kind of like Sonny Brown or uh, um, they are, they work for organizations, or they work for companies that do visual thinking for organizations. They help them problem solve and work through that. And they use these strategies that we're using um, or that we're teaching our kids, but it's actually not, that is their job. They go in and um, work with companies and try to get them to think differently or to visualize their problems. So um, some of his got a couple of books out. I think Game Storming is one of them. And then Dan Rome is somebody else that um, he's written several books on visualized thinking and um, using some of these strategies to help get your ideas out. Uh, I would I would look into those too. Um, yeah. There's also a ton of YouTube videos. I mean, we used Carrie's My Pencil Made Me Do It to kick off the whole unit, but there's like how to draw people, how to draw the icons. I mean, you name it, it is up there on YouTube. And if you ask students how they learn, most of them are gonna have YouTube in that list. So definitely you could share that out to kids or adults. Um, and I'll, I, yeah, um, I shared my resources and my presentations that have like all my how to's, um, Sarah, and I'll tweet them out as well. Um, but some people like, I learned literally by picking up a book. So I picked up the sketch note handbook by Mike Rohde um, and the Doodle Revolution by Sonny Brown. Um, another great one that um, a great resource to look at is um, on YouTube. There's a, <clears throat> Doug Neal has a channel called Verbal to Visual, and he's actually created like a whole course. You have to like pay for it, but it's worth every penny on like how to get sketch noting classroom because he used to be an educator. But he has a bunch of free stuff on there as well, like how to do sketch noting with Cornell notes um, and just different ideas. He's a great one to check out. 
Um, and then the other thing I know that's coming out soon is, so Sylvia Duckworth has a new book coming out. I got to preview it and it's amazing. And it's all about the basics of sketch shooting. It's more of like her last one was just a collection of what she did, but this one's more of like a how-to guide. So that's something, I'm not sure when it's out. It should be soonish. Um, but when that comes out, that's another great resource to tap. But other than that, yeah, it's just practicing and playing and suspending judgment because we are all our own worst critic. And I think a lot of times that's what keeps us from from trying to from trying to do this, right? So you really need to like kind of meet that critic and tell your inner inner self to be quiet so that you can just keep growing and keep practicing. And Sylvia shared a Google form link the other day on Twitter where people can actually sign up to get info about the book early. So I'll see if I can find it and retweet it with the EduMatch hashtag. Yeah, and then I, it just hit me that um, this is Misty with Sketch 50. <laughs> so that was like my biggest aha moment. Um, I did this the, the Sketch 50, and that's really what, what was the big game changer for me because I, I needed practice. Um, so kind of like what Misty was saying, you just have to be open to the practice. I'm still not a, as confident on the analog side of things. I'll have to work on it. Um, but I think in our classrooms, being able to embed digital and analog together only strengthens our kids. It makes me think about Project One Runway only because when it's time for design, they use, for many years, they use pen and paper. And about six years in, they started having devices. And so then they gave their contestants a choice. And I think that speaks volumes to the types of opportunities that are going to be available to our kids and how we need to empower them regardless of what tool they're using. So that's my big tip. Do sketch 50 and um, practice. And if you want to practice doing right now, Inktober is happening right now and it's a prompt that goes out every day. So um, just ignore all the beautiful artwork that the professional artists make, because that's like the thing is that, right, all the professional artists also participate in Inktober and it'll make you crush your soul. So you just have to ignore them and just make your own little doodles. Um, but you can look at Manuel's because his are awesome because he does a totally different take on it. He does like little 3D, um, like index card fun things. So um, again, just doodling every day. And sometimes it's hard to come up with what to doodle, but there are so many people um, out there that put out like monthly challenges where each day is like just one word prompts and literally just sit down for five minutes. That's all it takes. Something I would also recommend for kids to do, and I do this with our, our, our fifth grade because, uh, or at least I asked them anyway to do it. Um, is to keep like journals, like keep small notebooks. Um, I keep one in my back pocket all the time. And that's just to get an idea, if I have an idea and I can draw it out, and that's again, practice. That's just practice. You have paper on the ready, you have a pencil on the ready. Um, I think that's cool. I think that's, you can dedicate a little something to drawing or to sketching. Um, that helps build, build, build that confidence. Right, sweet. This has been such an amazing discussion. Really appreciate each of you bringing your insights. So a lot of people on the chat were saying that they wanted to uh, stay connected to all of you. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, saying where we can find you online, how people can connect with you, uh, that would be that would be awesome. I'm on Twitter at R L F R E E D M Raina Friedman. Martine Brown at MM Brown underscore Brown on Twitter. And I am um, on Twitter and Instagram as Manuel Herrera, M A N U E L H E R R E R A 33 <laughs> at gmail.com. So if you want to, if you want to do this project with me. Um, and then I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Misty Klusner, M-I-S-T-Y-K-L-U-E-S-N-E-R. Um, Misty Klusner at gmail.com if you guys want to connect. And then I also have a website that has a bunch of my resources. So it's just bit.ly slash Misty Klusner, capital M, capital K. So a bunch of my, like all my sketchnote presentations and stuff are on there. Feel free to go and take whatever you guys need. Sweet. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this amazing panel. This discussion was great. Cannot wait to put this out. This is at fire. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to everyone who is on the uh, YouTube live as well as on the Twitter um, portion of the chat. And we are going to be taking a break next week, but we will be back the following week. We're going to have Brian Kulak, um, who's going to be moderating a discussion on representation and leadership. So definitely looking forward 
to that. So join us, same bad time, same bad channel in two weeks from now. And also wanted to give a huge shout out to um, to Global Maker Day. So check them out, uh, globalmakerday.com. So um, organized and run by the amazing Jamie Donnelly, as well as an all-star team of organizers. Well, excluding me, I don't want to call myself an all-star, but there's <laughs> there's just a, a, a rock star group of folks putting it together and uh, definitely sign up if y'all are not already signed up. And also on that day, then we are going to launch the EduMatch Maker Book. And Martine is in there. She has a fantastic chapter on green screen. So make sure you check that out. So shout out to Martine, all of the contributors. Uh, see some of the contributors in the chat as well. So shout out to Katie and I'm, I'm sorry, my mind's going 50 million miles a minute. So if I'm going to start calling people out, then I'm going to I'm going to forget somebody. So I'm, I'll just stop myself there. But also wanted to um, also thank uh, Barbara Lee, all Susan Brown, the editors of the book. Excellent, excellent work. So uh, thank you, everyone. And I hope that you enjoy your the rest of your week. All right. Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.